I can see attendees are starting to roll in, so that's that is. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar in our series of presentations designed to help Kansas companies expand their exports. Today we will focus on the CE mark and European Union environmental regulations. My name is Jeff Willis, and I am the director of the International Division here at the Kansas Department of Commerce. I'll be your MC for today's event. This session will be recorded and will be accessible via our website once it has been posted. We look forward to any questions you may have, so please don't hesitate to post them at any time in the chat box. Towards the end of the program, we will go over your questions and hopefully have some good answers for you. Given today's subject matter and the expertise we have before you, please plan on this webinar to run at least the full hour. Depending upon the number of questions you may have, we can let the program continue past the hour mark for perhaps another 10 to 15 minutes. So don't hesitate to post your questions. For our speaker today, we're particularly fortunate to have Mr. Bob Straits. Bob is a European specialist in the Office of European Union and Regional Affairs with the International Trade Administration of the US Department of Commerce. In fact, we regularly work closely with the US Department of Commerce so that Together with our other export promotion service providers in the region, we can help Kansas companies increase their exports. Also on this webinar, but in non-speaking roles, are our locally based U.S. Department of Commerce commercial service representatives, A.J. Anderson, who is based in Wichita, and Josh Kaplan, who is based in Kansas City. I'm sure just like our team here at the Kansas Department of Commerce, they'll be more than happy to work with you on anything that may arise from today's session as well as your other exporting related needs. For those of you that may wish to pursue a CE mark, the Kansas Department of Commerce also has programs available to help you defray some of the costs associated with that pursuit. Just contact our office and we'll work with you to identify what can be done. Well, Bob Straits joined the Department of Commerce Office of European Union Affairs in October, 1988. During his first five years, he was editor of the 12-page quarterly newsletter, Europe Now, which had a circulation of 20,000 businesses. Since 1994, Bob Straits has been involved with CE Mark issues and has covered other issues such as the Euro and European standards. For the past seven years, he's followed three key EU environmental directives. The Waste of Electronic and Electrical Equipment Directive, the Restriction of Hazardous Substances Directive, and the Energy Related Products Directive. Well, from 1994 to uh, 2017, uh, Bob gave an average of four CE Mark talks per year in different U.S. cities across the country. He won the 2004 International Trade Administration Customer Service Award for working with exporters to help them meet European regulations and holds a master's degree in business administration from Pace University in White Plains, New York. Well, Bob, that's quite a lead in. We look forward to your session today, and I turn the uh, the webinar over to you, sir. OK. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. And um, <clears throat> I guess we can start with some of the slides. Um, I, um, I did look at some of the uh, background of the companies that are here and uh, some of the uh, products do present a bit of a challenge for CE marking so I can see why you would be you know attending this type of conference and 
perhaps would have had questions on CE marking. Um, some of the products were, you know, like I say, presented a, a, a good challenge. Hopefully at the end of this, you'll have maybe a better idea as to how to go about getting the CE mark so you can export to Europe. And uh, <clears throat> Jeff mentioned that the state of Kansas has some, uh, you know, uh, programs for CE marking and you can also contact uh, me as well and I'll give you my name at the end of this uh, session. But anyway, to uh, start with the conference, <clears throat> the uh, CE mark and EU environmental regulations is what we'll be going over today. OK, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the first thing we'll cover is the CE mark, which is the passport to selling into the EU market. 27 member states, 500 million people. <clears throat> OK, next. Yeah, there's the. Uh, the map of the you know CE mark countries, as I mentioned, 27 member states uh, shaded in the dark blue. Now you see a couple of that are in gray, like Norway <coughs> and um, Sw Iceland. Those are members of the European Economic uh, Union or um, Econ EEA economic association and they've adopted the CE marking as well and uh, but they're not members of the EU so we put them in gray. Switzerland you see is in white. Switzerland is not a member of the EEA. Uh, however, they've negotiated a lot of bilateral agreements with the Europeans so that uh, CE marking is pretty much the practice in Switzerland as well. And you have, of course, Ireland over there, but next to Ireland is the UK. As you probably all know, the UK left the European Union uh, at the beginning of last year. But uh, <clears throat> even though they left the European Union, they've adopted the CE Mark program. And through this year, if you're exporting to the UK, you can send CE Mark products over there and then starting in 2023, you'll have to put a UK CA mark on instead of a CE mark. But the requirements, uh, you know, are pretty are still going to be the same. Uh, you know, if you had to meet the machine directive to export to Europe or to the UK in the past, you'll still be meeting the machine directive. You'll just be putting a different mark on. That's all. OK, next slide. Uh, the CE mark program. Well, let's say the start with the single market program, uh, which came into effect in Europe in around the mid 80s is when they were developing um, ways to break down trade barriers to facilitate trade between uh, the different member states. You recall that, you know, member states had uh, set up trade barriers in the past to discourage trade and protect their own industries and this was hurting bad uh, Europe badly you know in against the Japan and the United States you know as they sought to compete. So <clears throat> they put together the single market program which was freedom of goods, services, people and capital. And the key cornerstone to the single market program is the CE mark. The CE mark shows that a product has attained a minimum sa uh, level of safety so that the different governments of the various EU member states would be assured that machines or whatever products coming from one member state to another would have at least the minimum baseline of safety to you know, protect their workers and consumers. OK, next. Now. Before 1987. You had the old approach. And this was, uh, you know, the directives were very specific, very lengthy, very specific, very technical. 
and they couldn't get anything through because another reason was they needed unanimous member state uh, approval, which is very, you know, almost impossible to get. So there would be all sorts of compromising going back to the drawing board and so on and so forth. And it took forever. They got three directives passed through autos, chemicals and cosmetics. But this is way too slow for developing a single market. So then they turned to the new approach uh, in about 1987, this this is where the directives take a horizontal approach. So in other words, a machine directive would apply to all the machines. And a directive on the electronics, EMC, electrical, electromagnetic compatibility and low voltage would apply to all electrical products. So another key here is that they introduce qualified majority voting among member states to pass legislation through. So these directives also, uh, you know, began the formation of uh, standards in Europe, uh, or it, 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 you know, led to standards being even it being used even more than they had been in the past. OK, next. <clears throat> directives are laws and, uh, you know, regulations, directives and regulations make up the core of the CE Mark program. Actually, they're going more and more now toward regulations because the regulation means that the uh, requirement, the CE rule has to be carried out exactly as it's written and it has to be enforced immediately. A directive oftentimes was you know, uh, sometimes allowed for member state interpretation, and it was, you know, usually 18 months, it, it, be, it started to be implemented 18 months after it was adopted. So more and more they're going to regulations now. Uh, <clears throat> the directives and regulations are proposed by the European Commission, amended by the European Parliament, and then approved by the Council of Ministers. U.S. companies have input into this system through both the Parliament and the Commission. So, uh, I mean, right now, for example, the machine directive is being revised. And so we got a copy of that. And our companies have a chance to um, comment on it through the um, TBT inquiry point and also uh, you know, companies can make, well, the commission itself sent out a uh, stakeholder, uh, you know, uh, form that allowed for comments to be made. So they took actually the initiative. <clears throat> and uh, the USTR and the Commerce Department is in contact with the commission now about some of the points of the machine directive, the new machine directive that uh, might be problems for uh, U.S. companies. So, you know, that's just an example of how U.S. companies can comment on uh, directives. OK, next slide. <clears throat> um, the directives and regulations provide the legal basis for the requirements, but the standards supply the technical information for meeting CE mark requirements. So in other words, if you look at the EMC, electromagnetic compatibility and the low voltage directive, they will say, well, you know, your product can't emit emissions that would interfere with nearby machines and it has to be immune from incoming emissions or in the case of low voltage, the product, you know, can't electrocute somebody, it has to be safe, it can't cause fire. That's one difference between their low voltage directive and ours is the, the fire requirement. But it doesn't give you the, you know, this the specifics, the technical way of doing this, and that's where the standards come in. So, you know, there's a set of standards that go with the EMC directive and a set of uh, standards that go with the low voltage directive. And it's up to companies to identify which one of those standards applies to their product and then use that standard and then that way they can say that they met the requirements of EMC and low voltage. US companies have a far greater chance of commenting 
on the development of directives than they do on shaping the standards. <clears throat> uh, this is something that the government has tried to change over the years, but not with much luck. Uh, you know, the Europeans, well, you, you kind of have to have a manufacturing presence in Europe in order to comment on their standards. Uh, you can comment indirectly through ANSI, American National Standards Institute. <clears throat> you can contact them and uh, find out, you know, more about what standards might be coming out in your product. And of course, you know, that's, you know, how do you know exactly? It's, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, but, you know, before the standard comes out, it's, well, it's it's difficult. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, we, we can come back to discuss that a little bit later. It's, uh, I'll say this, the Europeans are trying mostly to uh, adopt their standards after the ISO standards, the international standards. So that's at least some good news. And U.S. companies don't really have any complaints with that. Okay, next uh, next slide, please. Yeah, these are the European standards organizations. Um, you have CEN, which does the standards for machinery, medical pressure equipment, personal protective equipment. CENELEC is involved with the electrical aspect of standards, EMC, low voltage, medical, electrical. And then ETSI, European Union Telecommunication Standards, mostly for radio equipment directive products. Okay, next. <clears throat> These are some of the key directives that we, uh, you know, talk about with CE marking. I'd say that in the left-hand column, uh, you know, are the main, you know, the, the, the ones that are asked for most often, machinery, electromagnetic compatibility, low voltage and medical device. Uh, the others are also, you know, asked for, just not as much, but there's about 14 directives that I've listed here. There's probably about 24 directives in the, you know, the entire program. These are the ones that I thought were the most asked for, so I listed them, but there are others as well that, you know, aren't on this list. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll go into some of the, uh, you know, foundation concepts of CE marking. And the first, you know, we'll talk about the technical file. We'll talk about risk assessment reports. Then conformity assessments, uh, how it is that you certify your product for CE mark. Then declaration of conformity and then uh, finally enforcement and surveillance. OK. OK, the technical file is. Uh, the uh, first thing that you really have to be having in mind as you uh, prepare for CE marking. And the technical file shows that the product meets the requirements of the directive that you're complying with. And this includes the risk assessment report, uh, which would be at the top of the technical file. Uh, uh, okay. Excuse me, I'm sorry. For next Thursday, January 27th, will be between 3 and 6 p.m. Again, your installment for your wheels and a removal of your chair. Please unmute. Please unmute.
this is still say KS on there on there at the user. Are you good, Robert? I am muted, right? You're unmuted. You, how do you unmute this? You're you're unmuted. You're fine. Oh, I'm fine. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about that. I you know. Anyway, so the technical file is. Um, designs, the design drawings, the test reports, and the certificates. And let's, let's see, am I, can you hear me? We hear you. Okay, because my sign is saying that I'm muted, but if you can hear me, that's fine. Uh, the technical file has to be uh, written in one of the uh, official community languages, which would be English, German, or French. But the operating instructions have to be in the language of the user. And the technical file has to be available for 10 years after the machine has been put on the market. OK, next slide. Um, the technical file prov provides the proof that the CE mark compliance has been met in case EU enforcement authorities question the product. So this is why it's very important that the technical file has to be done uh, accurately because, you know, this this is the uh, validation of your product in case you're contacted by enforcement authorities. And you almost have to figure that you will be contacted even though you probably won't be contacted, but you have to assume that you would be. <clears throat> Authorized reps for medical devices and European representatives for machinery will insist on seeing the manufacturer's technical file because they uh, are, are, well, particularly the authorized rep for medical devices is somewhat legally on the line for the product. So they're going to want to examine the technical file and make sure that everything was done right. OK, next. <clears throat> Risk assessment, uh, which we talked about earlier. This is, you know, at the beginning, when you're getting the CE mark, you would assess the risks of your product. Uh, you know, it's the risk assessment is referenced in the machine directive, pressure equipment, medical device, EMC, and low voltage uh, directives. And a risk, I don't know, I heard somebody one time define risk as being uh, hazard times probability. That seems like a fairly decent definition. But anyway, a, kind of a more formalized definition, the protect for the machine directive anyways, the protective measures employed or to eliminate or reduce identified hazards and where these hazards can't be completely eliminated, the ways of warning the user about residual risk. So, you know, in other words, what are the hazards of my product? What did I do to eliminate those hazards? And in cases where I couldn't eliminate them, what am I doing to warn the user of residual risks? OK, next. So uh, warning signs and guards are ways to offset residual risk. And the uh, risk standard, now I know for example in the machine directive the risk, the description of the risk assessment is at the beginning of Annex 1. If you think that, that you can uh, get by with that, it's okay to go with what's up there at Annex 1 of the and the machine directive, but if you want a more detailed explanation of risk assessment, you would order the standard 12,100-2010. And uh, the risk assessment for the medical device directive, which is really a requirement, that one you have to use, is EN 14971-2019. Uh, you can purchase these uh, from uh, a place like Global Engineering, for example, I, I don't have their slide listed here, but you know, like 1-800-854-7179, but there's other places that you can buy standards from as well. Okay, next. <clears throat> now we'll talk about conformity assessment. Now that we've talked about technical file and risk assessment, 
Conformity assessment is the process carried out by the manufacturer to show that the product has met the appropriate CE mark directives. So how do you determine the conformity assessment? In other words, which method of you know, certifying for the CE mark am I going to take? <clears throat> Number one, what CE mark directive covers your product? Uh, there are, of course, quite a lot of products like a machine that would be covered by several directives, you know, the machine directive, the EMC and the low voltage. <clears throat> but uh, so you'd have to actually assess that, you know, to, to all three of those directives. Uh, the machine directive itself allows for self-certification in most cases by meeting the essential health and safety requirements seen in Annex 1 of the machine directive. Now, the first thing, if you make a machine, you would look at Annex 4 to make sure that your machine isn't listed as a dangerous machine, because if it's a dangerous machine, then you can't self-certify. You have to go, you know, get a uh, type approval, a, cer a certificate from a notified body. So, but there's only about 20 of those. So, uh, you know, 90% of the machines out there can be self-certified by meeting the essential requirements in Annex 1. Uh, things like, uh, you know, controls and uh, emergency on off switch and materials. Things that you would normally, uh, you know, think of when you think of uh, safety in a machine. <clears throat> and you can use your own, you know, as far as the machine directive is concerned, yes, there are standards that are listed, but you don't have to use the European standards for certifying to the machine directive. You can use whatever standards you used in the United States. Um, OK, so that would be called the internal production control method. All right, next. <clears throat> Other products such as, uh, you know, a dangerous machine, such as, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, or a class two, three medical device, certain kinds of personal protective equipment, you know, a, a class two or three personal protective equipment or, or pressure equipment, uh, you know, cannot be self-certified, has to be approved by a notified body because the products are seen as being too risky. And these are known as uh, type approval you send a type, your product, you know, an example of your product to the notified body and they approve it. And then they send back a certificate. <clears throat> and so for those kind of products, that's how you would have to certify to get to the C, to get the CE mark. There are labs in the United States that subcontract with EU notified bodies so that if you do make a product that's in this category, you can get testing and most usually auditing done in the United States for these products. OK, next. <clears throat> now we talked about the machine directive where you could. Uh, you know, you didn't have to use European standards and you could certify according to the essential requirements in Annex 1. The EMC and low voltage are a little bit different. Uh, de facto, you have to use European standards and you would need to confirm this with a lab test. Now, I think this discourages a lot of people probably, you know, the cost of the lab test. Uh, the lab does not have to be affiliated with the European notified body. It can be an independent lab as you know, it has to be accredited. But uh, nonetheless, you know, there's a fair amount of money involved and, uh, you know, this does uh, discourage a lot of SMEs, small, medium sized uh, manufacturers. OK, next. <clears throat> so now we're into the declaration of conformity. By this time, you've met all the requirements You've, uh, you know, you've, you've met the requirements of the directives that apply to your product. You've uh, completed a technical file. Uh, you have all your tests lined up and 
<clears throat> and you've affixed the CE mark to your product. And now it's getting time where you're going to ship product to Europe, and this is where you fill out the, tech, the uh, Declaration of Conformity. <clears throat> it's uh, a sheet of paper that tells EU Customs that the product has met CE mark requirements, so that when Customs gets the product shipment, they get a Declaration of Conformity. They know that they see that this product has met CE mark requirements, and they let it go through into the single market. <clears throat> the CE mark must be affixed near the nameplate of the manufacturer and must be at least five millimeters in height. Uh, so the manufacturer's name needs to be on the uh, product and, and so does the importer. And we'll get it, the importer's name needs to be on the product as well. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, next. And to complete the CE mark, uh, well, actually, we're, we're just starting now showing the example. <clears throat> this is a sample CE, uh, dec uh, sample declaration of conformity. Manufacturer's name in the upper left-hand corner, contact information, uh, the, the product, the model, serial number, uh, next. And then, you know, I, the, I have. I think I have three slides here. The three slides are one page, basically. Uh, you're putting down. The company would put down which directives it complied with. In this case, it was the uh, machine directive. Uh, I have to. Yeah. Okay. And the EMC directive. I'm not exactly sure why. Oh, you know why the low voltage directive wasn't put down. The the reason why is because oftentimes. The low voltage directive is covered under the machine directive. OK, that that they allow that. And uh, that's just the way labs sometimes do it. Um, so that the low voltage. Uh, actually, the reason why that is, is because the low voltage standard for machinery. Which is listed here, 60204 is listed under both the machine directive and the low voltage directive. So, you know, if, if you use that standard and put it under the machine directive, well, then you've met the requirements for the low voltage directive as well. OK, and then electromagnetic compatibility, then you're supposed to list the standards that you used. OK, so you'd have the risk assessment and then the uh, electrical safety, as we mentioned, for low voltage, which was under the machinery, and then the two EMC standards for immunity and emissions. OK, next. <clears throat> and then finally, you indicate where the technical file is kept and you sign it, which is your way of, uh, you know, taking responsibility for the fact that it meets the CE mark. Now, underneath it says name and contact information of European representative to meet the requirements of the good packaging directive of 2019 10 20. This is a directive that we are going to talk about a little bit later, but to, you know, just to jump ahead, you have to, if, if you're covered by a CE mark directive, you have to have somebody in Europe uh, listed on this declaration of conformity in case enforcement authorities come around and question whether or not the product meets the CE mark. They want to have the name and contact of somebody in Europe that they can contact, not somebody in America. <laughs> it's too far away. So I'll get into, I'll explain what that's about a little bit later. Okay, it's relatively new, as you can see, 2019, and it just came into effect actually in last July. Okay, next. Okay, now we'll turn to market surveillance because for, for quite a while, the, uh, you know, the Europeans had this program, let's say from 1998 to, you know, I don't know, about uh, 2006 or so, and there was a lot of questions about whether this was, uh, you know, program was really working and were people just putting a CE mark on a product and not really doing anything. And, uh, you know, so then they started instituting market surveillance uh, 
or at least forming the foundation for a market surveillance program. <clears throat> and they came up with two new regulations. Well, actually one regulation and one decision in uh, 2008 put in place to strengthen market surveillance, forcing each member state to set up a CE mark enforcement division. So CE mark surveillance has tightened considerably since 2008. And uh, we'll see here how they did this. They basically made the beforehand, it was pretty much the manufacturer who was responsible for everything. So then the question became, well, you know, suppose the manufacturer didn't do C, didn't comply with CE mark. What what is the Europeans going to do? I mean, are they going to go after companies in China or Japan or America? You know, you know, it's not likely that they had the legal authority to do that. So what they did was these uh, two regulations, the one regulation and one decision. Uh, ex extended the responsibility of, of who's responsible for CE Mark products to beyond the manufacturer to the importer, the distributor, and the distributor and the authorized rep. Okay, next. So, for example, the manufacturer has to, uh, you know, meet CE Mark requirements, has to have a technical file. And that's his job. Importer. Importer had to put, uh, by the way, the manufacturer also had to put his name and contact information on the product. Importer had to put their name and contact information on the product. Uh, they also had to be sure that the uh, product being put on the market met CE mark requirements. That's their responsibility. Uh, authorized reps had, <clears throat> you know, were supposed to be working with uh, the surveillance authorities. You know, if they suspected that a product wasn't in compliance with CE Mark, they were supposed to contact the surveillance authorities and tell them that. <clears throat> and distributors were kind of a cross between the manufacturer and the importers. They were supposed to make sure that you know, the, both names were on the products and uh, they also were supposed to contact surveillance authorities if they didn't think that the product met CE mark requirements. So you can see that there was an expanded scope here. Uh, and OK, next. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, each part of the supply chain had responsibility for making sure the product was CE mark compliant. And uh, I think I explained this, the second part, so we can go on to the next slide. <clears throat> well, one, one of the regulations, uh, let's see, the, the first one, basically uh, said that the CE Mark program was going to be, uh, you know, pretty much permanent, OK? And it's, you know, it, it talked about just a lot of the things we've gone over today, you know, about technical file, conformity assessment, uh, declaration of conformity, so on and so forth. So it institutionalized the CE Mark program, OK? That was that was the uh, decision, 2008-768. This regulation that we see here, 2008-765, was the one that set up the market surveillance program and the accreditation. Uh, I don't want to go up too much involved in accreditation, but basically what they were saying was that they wanted to make sure that the, the, the notified bodies that were doing this that were approving dangerous products were, uh, you know, met a standard that, that you know, that they uh, met a standard of competence so that when they came through with a certificate and approved a product that it really meant something. So 
each member state set up an accreditation body to uh, kind of review the notified bodies. OK, so that's that next. <clears throat> OK, here's that regulation that I was telling you about. That at the bottom of the machine, at the bottom of the Declaration of Conformity. So we have now, you know, expanded scope of who's responsible for CE mark compliance. But still, you know, it wasn't exactly perfect because, you know, there are some holes in that system. Somebody could say, well, you know, I thought it was CE mark compliant, you know, or something like that, or, you know, so. <clears throat> Uh, plus the commit, you know, the market surveillance authorities would have to go after four different people in the supply chain, the importers, the distributors, the authorized reps, you know, that gets to be kind of uh, cumbersome. So what they did was they said, well, now you have to have one person that's listed at the bottom of your declaration of conformity. OK, everyone doing business in Europe is considered an economic operator. No matter where you're from, whether you're established in Europe, whether you're United States, from, whether you're from Japan or China, if you have a product that's being sold in Europe, you're an economic operator. And you have to be represented by <clears throat> the manufacturer who has to be based in Europe. So that takes care of all the European people. They're represented by their manufacturer. The importer, OK, now we're getting into the United States territory. Who's going to be your, you know, representative, uh, you know? Uh, OK, the importer could be. Uh, the importer could be a distributor. An authorized rep. Or the fulfillment center is. You know, like uh, an Amazon warehouse. You know, if you're exporting a certain type of product, uh, Amazon could serve as the, um, you know, representative for you. <clears throat> so this is if you're exporting, certainly if you're exporting a machine to Europe, this is something to think about. OK, next. OK, I think I kind of explained this as a result of Article 4 in that above, you know, referenced uh, regulation 2019-1020, the EU market surveillance authorities will have the means by which to contact a single representative from a company making a product uh, which is uh, doing business in Europe. And as I meant, as mentioned before, this regulation applies to virtually all CE mark directives. So, you know, about half of our products going to Europe are CE marked. So that's a lot of products. <clears throat> okay, next. Well, we're coming kind of in the home stretch of the CE mark part of this program. Um, and I did want to take up a couple of issues here. The manufacturer is the person whose name appears on the product. The person putting his or her brand name or label <clears throat> on a final assembled product is now the manufacturer and is responsible for meeting CE mark requirements. Uh, a lot of times you come up with, you know, I don't know, private labeling situations where somebody is buying a product from somebody else and they're putting their name on it, but they're not manufacturing it. Well, if their name is on it, they're considered the manufacturer and they're responsible for CE mark requirements. <clears throat> when subcontracting takes place, the manufacturer is still responsible for CE mark requirements. So, you know, if you're making a medical device with your name on it, but all the manufacturing is done in China, they might be doing the CE mark work, but you're responsible for it. So you 
kind of better be checking up on what's going on. <clears throat> OK, next. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned this about the European standards. Technically, they're voluntary and they, you know, confer a presumption of conformity on the product on the uh, on those products this standards apply to uh, this is how kind of how the Europeans get out of a lot of legal problems you know they 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 always say well the use of our standards is voluntary <clears throat> and it's voluntary except that you know there's really no other way to meet the requirements for EMC and low voltage other than by using their standards and getting a test result. Because if you were to use another standard, I mean, I, technically it is possible, but if you were to use another standard, the problem is that if market surveillance comes around, what are they going to benchmark the product to? They're going to benchmark it. They're going to compare it to the European standards. That's just what they do. So that's where that rule, you know, anyway, yeah, you, you need to use European standards for EMC and low voltage. Components as a rule uh, by themselves do not need the CE mark, but when they're put into a product such as a machine, they have to be assessed as part of that uh, machine for CE mark requirements. Okay, so that's okay. Next. This is a review of what we did. Identify the uh, appropriate applicable directives that apply to your product and the standards. That's the hard part. Uh, and number two is kind of a uh, offshoot of number one. Well, number one is identify the directives and standards. Number two is assess in other words go through with actually uh, meeting those requirements and along the way you're preparing a technical file and then after you've done the difficult work comes the more administrative work the uh, prepare the declaration of conformity and affix the ce mark and then ship product to europe okay <clears throat> next slide please yeah, these are links. If you need to uh, find out information on European directives and standards, that top link is good. If you need to find out labs that can do testing for various CE mark directives, please use the bottom link. We have a list of labs. We have a list of consultants also that do uh, work on CE marking. So, <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> OK, I mentioned that about 50% of the products going to Europe are covered by CE mark directives. There are some products where safety is an issue, but it's not covered by CE marking. There's not a CE mark directive. Products, for example, like furniture, or gymnastics equipment, infant car seats, roller blades, and you know quite a few others. So these products would be covered by the General Product Safety Directive. Uh, this is a pretty much a self-certification directive. You're just going to be indicating how it is that you made the product safe and put that in a technical file and uh, that's that's acceptable. You don't put any mark on it though. If you are covered by this directive, you don't put a mark on it. You can fill out a declaration of conformity indicating that you met the requirements of this directive. Okay, next. Okay, so that's pretty much the uh, question for the CE mark. Uh, I mean the uh, section on CE marking. I don't know if there were any questions or anything like that uh, at this point.
There were some questions. There were some questions, Bob. Let me go ahead. And, uh, we have two in the uh, in the chat box. Let me go ahead and uh, and read uh, the questions. Yeah, go, can can you read them? By okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, first off, uh, are are these requirements, and they may be tied to uh, some of the presentations, so uh, please bear with me. Are these requirements the same for all medical device classifications? Well, medical device, and I didn't really go into too much on that. It, you know, that's, of course, there's a new program in now in Europe. Um, if you're doing medical device, the first thing is you have to figure out what classification your product is. That's the most important thing because from there everything kind of follows. OK, are you class one? In which case you can self certify. Class two and three, you're going to have to go to a notified body. So I don't know exactly what the product is, but you know, and then you, you know, <clears throat> you know, if you if you're class one, you one of the changes is now you have to use the quality control uh, standard one three four eight five. You didn't used to under the old medical class one, but now you do have to use it now. You don't need a notified body approval, but it's a very detailed standard. OK, it has to be followed. You need the risk assessment report and then you need to meet requirements and then you have to line up an authorized rep. So that pretty much sums it up. But of course, you know, easier said than done. But uh, so yeah, I mean, what I said, the principles of what I said apply to medical devices, but I was just a little bit more specific in answering the question on a medical device. Uh, product. OK, so we have another question as well, Bob. OK, if, uh, if you've got that, um, could the end user be considered the rep for the particular piece of equipment uh, going into Europe? Uh, yeah, I mean. Well, the end user in Europe is is the. Uh, is the importer. So, I mean, if they agree to that, fine. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're just exporting a lot of stuff to one person, that certainly makes sense. But if you're exporting things to a lot of different companies, well, I mean, if they agree to it, fine. Yes, yeah, sure. But, uh, uh, so that's, you know, I mean, the answer is yes, if they agree to it. Great. Well, here's another question for you, Bob. If I am exporting a building that has protective systems or electronic equipment as a component, do those components all need to be CE marked or is the whole assembly not on the list of products, not CE mark required? Uh, could you read that one again? Yeah, it's a little bit embedded. I think it has to do with components versus complete system. Uh, yeah. If I'm exporting a building that has protective systems or electronic equipment as a component, do those components all need to be CE marked or is the whole assembly, in this case, I presume uh, part of that building, that whole assembly that's not on the list of products, uh, not CE mark required? You know, I'm having trouble envisioning exporting a building. I mean, in, in, in other words, parts to a building, right? And, and I presume it's not a fully assembled, but yeah, yeah parts yeah, to a parts building. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, well, certainly it's going to have to be done when it's over there and it's assembled. Um, I'd say that, you know, I'd say that it would be CE marked when the building is uh, constructed. Well, that sounds like a good 
it sounds like a good basis to go forward, but perhaps uh, our questioner, uh, Dean, can uh, pose the question again offline, uh, either to us, and we'll pass it along to you with a little bit more clarification, uh, yeah. and or uh, to AJ uh, Anderson or Josh Kaplan uh, in the US Commercial Service. Uh, but uh, okay, well, that sounds like a good answer for right now. Maybe we'll get some uh, further clarification. Yeah, yeah uh, I see. see. Uh, okay, it's a modular. We do have clarification here, Bob. Uh, it's a modular building with an air conditioner on the outside, for example. Yeah. Would each component need to have a CE mark? At what level of assembly, you know, is covered by a singular mark? It seems. Yeah, that's 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 a tough question. I think I'd have to look into that. I mean, I'd be glad to look into it. If, you know, if you want to give me the person's name or something, an address or uh, email. But uh, you know, you know, for one thing, modular building. So that is is going to be covered by construction products directive, and then uh, air conditioning. Yeah, that certainly needs to meet CE mark requirements for, uh, you know, EMC and low voltage probably. And, <clears throat> you know, but there's other electronic components in this building you're saying. So, you know, um, I think I'd have to look into, you know, how the other electronic components would be covered, but seems to me a modular building is covered by construction products. You know, that covers, you know, buildings and, uh, you know, bridges and things like that. Okay, well, thank you. That's why, that's why we give you the hard yeah, questions. But that's, that's <laughs> not, yeah, that's not a definite, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, don't, sure. can't bet the mortgage on that. That's it, something I would have to look into and I'd be glad to look into it, but you know, if you want to send me the person's name or or you could, you know, I could do it on your behalf and you could send whatever answer I find on to him. So, OK, sounds good. We'll follow up. Uh, thank you. We have another question uh, also in this CE Mark uh, area. Uh, how typically are costs associated with the CE Mark uh, paid for uh, the export, uh, the exporter strictly or are they normally split? I'm pretty sure that the exporter, you know, like if you've got a company in this country that wants to export a product to Europe, I think the exporter is paying for the cost of uh, CE mark testing, you know, like if it's electrical equipment and you have to go to a, <clears throat> you know, a lab like Washington Labs in our area in Maryland or something like that, I mean, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, I think the exporter is going to be paying for that. OK, well, we have another question here. Uh, it gets pretty uh, detailed here, pretty, uh, pretty specific. Can MDR 2017 slash 745 DOC cover the EC DOC or do you need a separate one? Yeah, it's pretty specific. What, what MDR? What? Yeah, that's the MDR medical device. MDR 2017 slash 745. Yeah, that's the medical device directive. Yeah. Ah, can it, so we're, yeah. Yeah. Can it do what? Can it? Can the, uh, that uh, directive cover the ECDOC, or do you need a separate one? Can that document? Can that? I presume it's document. Can MDR 2017 745? Uh, DOC uh, cover the EC DOC, or do you need a separate one? I'm not sure that we're we've the got EC the question component? right because I mean he's he's asking you know he's asking a question about the medical device directive, um, you know, but uh, I don't I don't really understand that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, um, I I mean, I know you read it to me, but 
you know, I don't know what EC, the uh, East European Community Declaration of Conformity. I mean, is that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the last thing you fill out after you've met all the requirements of the medical device directive. You know, you you fill out the declaration of conformity as you uh, are shipping the product to Europe, but I'm not sure that's what he meant in, in the question. Okay. Well, because some of these questions can be quite specific uh, and uh, given uh, a little bit of time required to be able to take a look at what they say, uh, our in the chat box, uh, our uh, main contact point, uh, Kathleen Daltmeyer, has uh, presented her email, and so you can always pass those uh, along if you email Kathleen Beltmeyer, and she's again uh, put her email address in the chat box, we can pass those along. In fact, AJ Anderson, who I mentioned earlier, who is the commercial service uh, director in the Wichita office, uh, he says that either he or Josh, uh, Josh Kaplan, the, uh, the director of the Kansas City office, can set call appointments uh, with you, Bob, for anything you, that anybody wishes to discuss with you uh, further. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, make sure that we put everybody in touch with everybody else. But we've got a number of points of uh, contact here through us, us Kathleen Daltmeyer with email, uh, and so through AJ Anderson or Josh Kaplan. Uh, and we can certainly get those questions to you uh, via modes, uh, Bob. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and move on to the EU environmental, unless you have another another uh, point you want to make in the CE mark segment. No, I think I'm done with that. Okay. We'll just go through the. Okay, so okay, well, let's go ahead and move to uh, the next part. Uh, your next slide. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, the three main environmental directives I'm going to talk about are the uh, Restriction of Hazardous Substance Directive, the, uh, right, those are the, uh, the uh, Energy Related Products Directive, and the Waste of Electrical and Electronic Equipment. These are all primarily for electrical and electronic equipment, okay? <clears throat> the Restriction of Hazardous Substance, or the ROS Directive, ROHS, applies to electrical and electronic equipment. It restricts the use of 10 substances, including lead, mercury, cadmium, hexavalent chromium, two flame retardants, and four phthalates. Uh, you know, the I, this directive has been around for about 15 years, and I, I don't know, about 20 years ago, there was some incident in Europe, I forget exactly what, but uh, somebody found something, one of those substances, they, you know, was causing a problem of some kind, a health problem. And so then more investigations were done, and they, at the time they came out with six substances that they thought were very hazardous that needed to be eliminated or highly restricted from electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, you know, the, the, the four that have been added since those original six are the four phthalates. So if, well, you know, I think I'll touch on this in the later slides, but if you're making any kind of electrical or electronic equipment, you can't have those substances in your product beyond a restricted amount, which is listed in Annex 2 of the Ross Directive. It's 0.1 generally. Cadmium is 0 0.01 parts per uh, parts per thousand, I believe, or is it parts per million? I'm not sure, but. Uh, at any rate, it's you know it's it's outlined in uh, Annex Two of the Ross Directive. Okay. <clears throat> so, how does the company comply with this? Well, well, one way is you could test the product. You know, I didn't put that here, but you know, there's those uh, X-ray guns that they have that you know that you can uh, use to see if these products are 
in the, you know, these substances are in your product. Uh, you can go to a lab and, you know, when you're getting the EMC and low voltage tested, you could have them do a test on Ross as well. Labs, all sorts of labs. Any lab that does testing for EMC and low voltage is going to be able to do Ross testing. Uh, <clears throat> but if you didn't want to do a test, then you'd go to your supply chain and you contact them and you'd say, well, make sure that all the materials and parts that you've been selling us are Ross compliant. In other words, that they meet the requirements of Annex 2 of the directive. Okay, and uh, then they have to send back a statement to you saying, yes, we're Ross compliant, but it's not just good enough for them to send you a statement. They have to send you a statement saying they're Ross compliant, but how do they know? They have to prove that they're Ross compliant. Okay, that's what you want to see. And then you want to put that information from all your suppliers into a technical file. And if you have confidence that everybody knows what they're doing and is, you know, up to date on Ross and is really uh, doing this, then that technical file is okay to use to say that you met the requirements. If, if there's, however, doubts on your part as to whether or not the suppliers have met requirements, that's when I would suggest that you think about getting a test yourself and then the test certificate leaves no doubt that you met Ross requirements. <clears throat> so there's Ross exclusions for large scale stationary industrial tools, large scale fixed installations, non-road mobile machinery for professional use and there's some others listed as well but would be for more specific types of products. Okay, next. Ross is a CE mark re directive, so that means you have to list it on the Declaration of Conformity. And that means it's subject to market surveillance. <clears throat> so the, and, and I know for a fact that they are enforcing this. So, you know, <clears throat> that's why it's important that you comply with this directive. Uh, I just mentioned how you would put together the technical file. That would be either the documentation from your suppliers or a test result which you got on your own. Okay, I think the rest of this I've mentioned. Uh, so next. Okay, now we'll go to energy related products. The Ross Directive covers all electrical and electronic equipment. Energy related products regulations cover specific product groups. Uh, the idea, of course, is to improve energy efficiency. However, there are some of these uh, regulations that do involve uh, resource allocation. For example, how much water a washing machine can use would be one example. <clears throat> uh, mostly electrical and electronic products are covered by the ERP regulations, but there are a few non-electrical products like tires and glass, well, tires definitely now, glass windows could be covered in the future. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, these are examples of uh, products covered by energy related products. Lighting, now I recall that I saw somebody in the conference was making lighting. So you would want to be looking into this. Uh, heating, refrigeration, vacuum cleaners, washing machines, air conditioners. I just listed eight here. There's probably about 30 that are covered. <clears throat> you can just Google uh, energy, European Union energy related products and you can see the list. And these products are, you know, 
evolving and developing and they're adding. And by the way, as long as I'm here, you know, that's the one thing I didn't mention at the end of the CE mark is that, you know, everything is evolving and developing. There's always going to be new directives listed, maybe every seven or eight or nine, well, every 10 years for a directive, but standards are revised about every five to six years. So, you know, if you're complying today with, uh, you know, you know, some kind of uh, electronic device and you get EMC and low voltage and you're using particular standards. You can't just say, you know, I've had people call me and say, well, my product got stopped at the border. I don't know why we did the CE marking 20 years ago. I mean, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that you're about three generations behind and they pick this up. Uh, this person listed the wrong the, the old citation for the directive, so that was a dead giveaway. But beyond that, he didn't have, wasn't using the uh, current standard. Now, you know, if you have a product in Europe for a number of years, then that's kind of, okay, it's over there, that's fine. But if you have something that you want to send over that's new, then it has to meet the requirements of what's current. Okay, next. <clears throat> yeah, as far as the energy related products, one thing about them is that, the, you know, all the requirements are listed in the directive. So it's not like the EMC or low voltage directive, which is general requirements and standards give you these specifics. No, here it's all in the, in the direct, well, in the regulation, uh, you know, the energy efficiency requirements or anything to do with resource allocation. It, <clears throat> it's uh, all there and, you know, a company can self-declare for this regulation. And, but again, this is also a CE mark regulation. So you have to, you know, if your product is covered by one of these energy related products, you have to list it on the Declaration of Conformity and you have to put together a technical file showing how you met the requirements. So, you know, you could, you know, you could use the, the regulation, but you probably have to run some kind of an internal test to prove that you met the energy efficiency requirement. Okay, next. Okay, I mentioned this before that the Ross Directive applies horizontally to all electrical and electronic equipment, whereas the Energy Related Products Regulation aims for specific products, washing machines, computers, dryers, and about 20 or 25 other products with more in development. Okay. Next, please. Okay, this is the last of the environmental, the uh, waste of electrical and electronic equipment. This is a recycling. You're, it's really a mandatory recycling uh, directive. So you can see the Europeans have put together a fairly elaborate environmental program here. I mean, you've got the Ross Directive, <clears throat> which is taking out hazardous substances from electronic products. You've got the Energy Related Products Directive, which is trying to boost energy efficiency and perhaps resource use. And then you have the Recycling Directive, the waste of electrical and electronic equipment, which, you know, does just that. It, it you know, it recycles electronic waste and uh, with the attempt of reusing it again in some some form okay yeah this directive is this this is uh, you know if you do have electronic or electrical equipment you should put this insignia on your product right alongside the ce mark and you should probably put down you know like uh you know a, a, a you know like a website where information, where you have product information listed and you can 
tell recyclers, you know, where the uh, hazardous substances might be. So it makes things easier for them. OK. Now, usually the European customer will be taking care of the uh, WE requirements. And those involve registration with the member state authority where the product is being sold, reporting, you know, how many, how much product is being put on the market and how much is being uh, re recycled, and then recycling. You know, this is where the person would line up a recycler who would take away the electronic waste and send it to a treatment center. Generally, like I say, this is going to be done by your by the you know person in Europe using your product. The WE directive is not a CE mark directive, so we're not dealing with technical files or anything like that here. <clears throat> OK, next. So in conclusion, about half of all US exports to Europe are covered by the CE mark. The cost of lab test results, especially for the EMC and low voltage standards, are the biggest drawback for SMEs. Although, as Jeff mentioned, the Kansas apparently has a uh, program where they can defray some costs, and a lot of states have that. Not all states, though. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, but the CE mark does allow access to a lucrative market of 500 million people. And as I mentioned, uh, oh yeah, you have to be aware of changes that are uh, occurring in standards and directives. And the uh, what's happening now is the machine directive is under revision, and so is the Rojas directive. And we didn't talk about reach today because I'm not really the expert on reach, but reach is important. There, and there were a couple of companies that I noticed here that would be covered by reach. Uh, and if they want to get in touch with Jeff or AJ and or Kathleen and send, you know, the request on to me, you know, I, uh, you know, I can maybe get answers from the experts on that and. I mean, for example, yesterday I got a note from somebody at the US mission in Brussels saying that four new uh, substances are very high concern. OK, that's a phrase from reach were added involving lubricants. So, you know, now, you know, so, so you would have to test, look and see if those substances are in your lubricant. And then uh, if they are, then I guess, you know, this is, well, like I say, I'm not the expert, but, you know, you, you have to, you're going to have to notify, you're going to have to mark it down in your own file. And I believe you have to, at the minimum, tell your customer about this. So, but like I say, I, I can get you in touch with an expert if you're covered with reach and they covered by reach and they can help. Anyway, I guess that's about the end of the presentation. So uh, thank you for people that sat through. And, uh, you know, I don't know, are there any other questions? I can try to answer them at this point. And, uh, well, uh, thank you, Bob, for uh, your really uh, fulsome, complete presentation. You covered a lot of territory. Uh, and I know there's a lot more territory to cover when you get into the details in the weeds. Yeah. Uh, we do have one more question here, which is kind of uh, focusing in on some of the cost, uh, uh, costs associated with this. Uh, our uh, questioner says, can you talk a little bit more about some of the possible costs for lab testing? Uh, their products are decorative lighting, and they're a small manufacturer. Like you said, the cost burden for SMEs is, is challenging, but they're a small manufacturer, and they're just trying to get a ballpark idea of what kind of costs might be involved uh, for uh, the lab testing associated with uh, some of their decorative lighting products. Yeah, uh, 
you know, it's uh, is there a range if, you might be able well, to probably somewhere between I don't know twelve to twenty five thousand some somewhere range like that. I you know it's but you know they you need to uh, ask and find out on their own. You know. Uh, you know, I have a couple of people that I work with that they could call and ask or, you know, uh, DLS is one I use in Illinois and Washington Labs, you know, in Maryland, you know. Um, <clears throat> but offhand, I'd say you know, that would be my ballpark estimate. You know, you ask for a ballpark estimate, that's, that's what I'm saying, okay? I don't, you know. Well, yeah, no, uh, your uh, your ballpark, I think, is gonna at least give some information. And uh, really, uh, if folks uh, wish to follow up, uh, I will be happy to uh, provide that uh, follow-up for you, Bob. I know Kathleen, uh, you can email her and AJ, or Josh Kaplan, also listed uh, in the uh, uh, here attending this event, uh, and AJ Anderson, who is the uh, director in the commercial service in Wichita, Josh Kaplan in Kansas City. All of us uh, can take uh, any of those specific questions and uh, follow on with them to you. Uh, and perhaps you can give them a couple of ideas of some of the testing uh, facilities you described, and then they could reach out to them directly to find out. Uh, what kinds of costs uh, those facilities uh, may uh, may uh, charge. Um, okay. I see we have a request for the copy of the slides. Uh, those will be available. Uh, we certainly have a recording of this uh, webinar up on our website uh, and the uh, slides. Uh, Bob, uh, those slides are, are available uh, to listeners as well. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. All right, yeah. excellent. And uh, uh, we do have here, uh, AJ has listed uh, some information. He does have a contact that will work with the company's engineering staff to help uh, that company with the self-certification uh, if, uh, if uh, need be. Um, so uh, please uh, don't hesitate to follow up. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll pursue that. Uh, Bob, we really appreciate this uh, presentation today. Uh, I know every time uh, when I was in the private sector, we, we dealt with CE, we definitely had to reach out to uh, the CE market, out to reach out to specialists. And so uh, we very much appreciate this and uh, this point of contact information as well. Well, with that, uh, I think uh, it's uh, now 1123. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, finish uh, our event here today, but uh, clearly we'll have the opportunity to follow up a little bit later on. So. Thank you very much, Bob, for this, and uh, I look forward to uh, further contact with uh, our webinar participants as well. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, AJ and Kathleen and Mike. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, take care.